Well, here in uh, British Columbia, they now have it. Uh, you can get a, an, an enhanced driver's license with that mm -hmm. bio ID, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. Also, as of June 1st, every single Canadian that leaves Canada, no matter where you travel, once you travel outside of Canada, you have to have that passport in mm -hmm. hand, mm -hmm. which is additional cost, right? Yeah, it's and expensive as well. I mean, certainly in the UK, it's about £80 for the passport and another £60 for the ID card if you get it. Uh, you mentioned the Channel Islands. Actually, mm -hmm. the Channel Islands during World War II were occupied by the Nazis. That's as close as the Nazis got to Britain. Yeah, that was the only bit of Britain they actually occupied, um, which was a sort of tragedy for the island I came from because up to that point, it, had, it was very French. It had a French heritage and everyone was a uh, native French speaker uh, or bilingual spoke English as well. But of course, when the Nazis invaded, then all the children were evacuated to the UK mainland and came back speaking English. So the death of a culture just like that overnight. So how close do you think that, that the UK is, is at this time? I remember you during your talk that you were talking about how uh, the chips, right? And mm -hmm. how some people basically think it's a great idea because they go out drinking, they put their hand up the mm. bar, and boom, they can get their drinks. You know, how close is the, is the UK to, to getting the chip? Because that, that chip comes out of Florida. There's a Florida company that manufactures it. Yeah. So I'm yeah, just, yeah. just wondering if you heard anything. Uh, well, I gather it's um, being used in Florida as well for old people's retirement communities, in case, you know, someone with Alzheimer's goes walkabout or whatever. And, of course, it, some communities are putting chips in children as well because that keeps them safe, they think, from all these evil paedophiles lurking on every street corner. Which, I mean, you know, of course, people like that exist, but not to the level of scaremongering we get in the newspapers. Um, in the UK, it's interesting because there has been a huge pushback against the notion of these biometric ID cards, which is the first step towards chipping people. Um, and also it's going to cost a fortune, so the UK is pretty broke at the moment. It might not be able to afford to roll it out. But there is an awareness there's been a very effective campaign against ID cards. If the ID cards are blocked, then that will delay the rolling out of the chips. It will become a voluntary um, issue so that people could, again, chip their children for safety or old people. But more worryingly, as I mentioned, as you said in the talk, the idea that people could choose to have a chip put under their skin is a lifestyle choice. I mean, there are nightclubs in London and uh, other cities where you get preferential treatment. You have the nightclub chip where you can actually store a certain amount of money and all the rest of it on the data. And you bypass all the queues to get into the clubs. You go and sit in the VIP section. So they're selling it as something cool. You don't have to take your wallet in. You just, as you say, put it over the reader at the bar and get some more drinks. And I just can't believe that people be such suckers. But then I suppose, you know, the success of programs like Big Brother, you know, that awful uh, reality TV show, I always felt was almost like grooming the population to see constant surveillance as something good, something to aspire to, something that will give you a cool factor, an instant Z-list celebrity. And um, I, it is, it's a bit like being groomed as a population, I think. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how with this reality TV, even with Survivor and all the rest, mm, that people mm. are thinking, you know, once they get in front of the camera, then they can get these 15 minutes of fame, and they don't realize what they have to give up in order to get that. Yes. And getting to the next point, I remember a long time ago, I read a report where it said that uh, during the Canadian election, we have this number right next to our name and number next to the ballot you're voting. Mm -hmm. And what they, uh, they used to do in the past, we were ta probably talking about uh, prior to the Eastern Bloc countries falling. Uh, every time that they had a federal election here in Canada, every time someone voted communist, the name was taken and then put on uh, a list down the United States and had over the United States and it was blacklisted in the United States. So uh, I'm not sure if that's still happening right now. However, we still have the numbers next to our names and the number next to the ballot. So, you know, there's probably a chance that they're using this to possibly go after the no-fly list because if mm -hmm, someone mm -hmm. votes for a radical party that they don't agree with. Uh, what have you heard, like, in, in regards to the UK? Have you heard of something like this happening when the people go towards uh, their, their election or... Uh, as, far as, information. Yeah. as far as I'm aware, uh, we had the same system, which is numbers next to your name. So there's no such thing as a real secret ballot. Um, although I have to say I haven't voted in years because I just don't think there's much point. I don't agree with either of the options. <laughs> as my lawyer said to me, don't vote, it'll just encourage them. <laughs> um, but yes, of course, the, um, that would flag up people's affiliations and it was misused and abused. Um, in fact, not just in the UK, but across Europe. I know someone who um, was from Holland and uh, um, had been in their youth a member of the Communist Party. And every time they went into the uh, USA, they were pulled aside at immigration and grilled about their communist affiliations. How that came up, who knows? Um, and I think as well, it's not just the communists. Of course, in the era of the Sov Soviet Union, then 
they could pretend to justify an interest in you know people being communists they might be trying to subvert the fabric of our society but i don't think that's ever 100 percent gone away they still take an interest in activists and um, campaigners and people involved in left-wing groups certainly in the uk in fact i think it's ramped up over the last few years because of the success and the profile of the peace movement and a lot of people who are involved in uh, more radical politics of course are anti-war so I think there's been an increase again of surveillance of these sort of groups not just by MI5 and not just by the police but also by private security firms um, who farm out this sort of the MI5 sort of farms out this information to organizations like Kroll or Diligence or Blackwater or whatever and get them to send in agents and to monitor who's involved in these sort of agencies so it, it is a problem um, and I think it's going to get worse because of course where, as the credit crunch bites further um, parties like the Communist Party will become more attractive to people across the world. I mean, I gather even in Japan, membership has risen exponentially in the last few months of the Communist Party. They've never had a significant membership in, in Japan, of course, but suddenly it's going up because the workers feel that they're being ripped off, they're being temp given temporary jobs, they're not giving job security, all the rest of it. So they're turning towards something like the Communist Party. Here in uh, British Columbia, um, I was talking to you earlier prior to the uh, interview here, uh, Recently, I came across uh, court documents mm -hmm. and other information, which shows how companies like Ash for, or Ashgrove and Lafarge, uh, Lafarge is the biggest cement company in the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're doing at this time, thanks to the past NDP government here in British Columbia and the past social credit government here in British Columbia, they passed laws which were... Um, Bad laws. They were not in keeping with the Canadian federal laws. And what they've done is they've allowed these companies to come in here and acquire rock and then mm -hmm. start shipping the rock down to the United States to be processed. And they forget to inform the Canadian customs about the billions of dollars worth of minerals that are in the rock which are being extracted down to the United States. I have over uh, about uh, 250 pages of documents on my website at this time which talks about that. Now, that's one prime example mm -hmm. of how the corporate elitist, right? I'm, I'm someone, I'm a centralist. I mm -hmm. believe in the rights of the people. Yeah. But that's an example of export. You know, they, they're exploiting the people. And, uh, and they're basically, they're looking at the system as nothing more than a mockery. Mm. And all we have to do to get that money back is to basically tell our members of our provincial government and the federal government to step in and say, look, start acting like you're being elected for the people and, start, uh, and stop acting like you've been put in place by the corporate elitists. Because at the same time, one last point about this. Uh, in 1995, they passed this law here in British Columbia, which allowed, it was called the Mineral Amendment Act, mm -hmm. Bill 13. And in this law, they, crashed, they scratched out the name minister, and they substituted it with the name gold commissioner. So what they did was they took the power of the resources, and they gave it over to the bureaucrats. Yeah. And it's in there, right in black and white. All you have to do is go look at it. It's on the website with a, a copy of the, the 1995 Mineral Amendment Acts up there, too. But that's a pure example of how Canada, once again, has been turned into nothing more than leaf and space. Mm -hmm. And the, all, like, the question I have for you, how can we, the people, get control of our nation again and put it back in the hands of the people only? <laughs> well, it's a very good question. I wish I had the answer for it. <laughs> all I can say is good luck. Um, it is difficult, of course, because um, we are up against what in Britain is called the establishment. It's the same system wherever of political, corporate, media, intelligence elites who um, work pretty much within a sort of revolving door. You know, they leave one organisation, they'll get a job in another. So they're all chummy, they all know each other and they all look after each other and they don't really give um, much thought to the interests of their country or the interests of the people, only their own class interests. And it is difficult. I think we need... I mean, too many people just get on with their lives and they expect their governments to act in the best interests of their country and they don't. They will act in the best interests of multinationals and um, international organisations. So we need to stop passively consuming and believing what we see in the mainstream media. We need to get informed, do a bit of digging ourselves, start thinking again um, and get active. I mean, it's about taking back our democratic power as citizens, not subjects. I know you have the same problem with the Queen as we do, but as citizens we need to be part of a country and that comes with responsibility as well as rights, you know, and the responsibilities are to make a fuss, to campaign, to hold these people to account. Um, it is possible, though, to stop the juggernaut of multinationals. Uh, for example, in some European countries, there's been a pushback against the Microsoft monopoly, for example. Um, 
and just lone citizens can start a snowball effect of activism, getting people informed and aware of quite how much Microsoft is ripping off European governments, um, you know, selling the proprietary software and, you know, getting money in uh, on the leases every year and things like that. It was costing Europe billions and billions and billions of euros. And uh, one or two people could get together and with a bit of smart campaigning actually um, gain some leverage by spreading the word across the internet and using that to get the word out, but also um, by intelligently approaching certain key politicians to get the sort of high level leverage and make the issue very painful. So it's easier for the politicians to actually do something about it than not to do something about it because it becomes too painful if they don't do something about it and their profile suffers in the public and you know people are aware they're not doing their job properly. So it's adding that degree of pain. So the politicians want to do something to stop that degree of pain and um, then they take action. Then the issue becomes something that is a talking point. And in some countries now, Microsoft has pretty much been taken off the menu for public sector workers at least. And um, indeed, they've ended up being fined. They're, Microsoft is a multiply convicted monopolist in the European courts and has been fined the biggest corporate fine in history in Europe recently. I think it's up to about 1.6 billion euros, all because citizens banded together and tried to make a difference. So it may look hopeless sometimes. You see these multinational juggernauts and everything. But if you're determined and you're clever, you can make a difference. And I would urge everyone, therefore, to, you know, to think what is it they passionately care about and to go and do something about it, not just talk about it. And with that point, uh I remember watching the documentary. It was done there by uh, Lyndon LaRouche uh, Foundation. And what they did was uh, there were some points in the documentary I, I really didn't agree with his stance on, but there were some points I really did agree with his stance because what he was saying was the British Empire, they create this free trade, right? And whereas the American was basically, they're, they're worried about themselves first, their own nation first, mm -hmm. and their own people first, and then basically trading with other nations. Mm -hmm. the, the Americans, had, it almost like at that time, years ago, they adopted what Frederick the Great had uh, in regards to Prussia. Frederick the Great thought that any single uh, goods that were being produced within his nation, he didn't allow them to be dumped in his nation. He uh, when they were being imported, he didn't want his nation to turn into an economical dumping ground. Mm -hmm. But however, with the, the free trade now in existence, right, I, I look at that as nothing more than a uh, the British Empire is continuing its uh, grasp on the people, which is further destroying the nations and allowing the, the monarchy system of the old that existed prior to the, the Magna Carta in existence, I see it starting to rise again. And uh, I, I, the only way I can see correcting this situation is for the people to stand up in numbers and say to their government, we don't want free trade anymore. We want to worry about our own nation first. And then once we worry about our nation, we can allow more people into our nation and allow them safety, which therefore we can build uh, more and more for the people mm -hmm. and then start exporting any excess that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way that Canada should start looking at things and other nations at the same time should start looking at things. Rather than send our troops anywhere, why not first worry about our own nation and then we can allow people from these war-torn areas to come in here, immigrate here, bring their culture, bring their, the, the way they look at stuff so it can further build our multiculturalism mm -hmm. and at the same time can help out our nation and help out the basically the people that are running from war situations. Mm. That's what I, that's what I look at right the situation but okay. uh we're we're almost we're running close to a break right now so we're going to quickly take a quick break and uh we're going to come back in about uh four minutes with annie uh the annie Machant we're talking to right now it's co-op radio 102.7 fm cfro with monday brown bagger the date is uh may 25th 2009 we're going to take a break and come back in about uh four to five minutes <laughs> 